This right here is the QX. This is one of the most astonishing pieces of technology that I ever have held in my hand. So let's talk about it. So here we go. This is the QX and uh, for you guys, this little fan down here is just something that I put there because I wanted to cool the MOSFETs that are down there a little bit better. But don't worry about this. This is just some, some testing setup for me here. So usually you would not have uh, this sort of setup. So let me, let me get rid of this quickly and let me show you how it usually would look like. You would just have this one fan here and it would be spinning and that is how the QX looks. Like you can see, it's a CPU cooler mounted to this PCB here. And uh, down there we do have four ASICs. But for the reason of cooling those uh, MOSFETs that I spoke about, let me put back the splitter cable that I do have here. So yeah, this, this right here is the QX. And today's video is a little bit of a talk about what the QX is and what it can and what it cannot. For this reason, I want to show you how the bare PCB itself looks like. And if you have not taken a look on my live stream that I did, where I assembled all those SMD components on this PCB, uh, I highly suggest you to do so. So let me, let me zoom in and let me show you how this PCB looks. As you can see, we do have here four small sections and of each of those sections we will put in one ASIC. Currently this board here is not functional. This is due to the limited possibilities from my end. I was about to actually program the STM on here, but more on this later. So let's take a look on, on the PCB itself in the first clubs. So what do we do have here? So the QX, and some of you are not familiar with what this is, is a PCB that can be used to mine Bitcoin. It does have, it does have the room for four A6 down here. All those A6 will be the BM1366 Bitmain A6 chips from the S19 XP. And therefore this board here can reach up to two terahash at like 50 watts. Sometimes I do get like 2.4, 2.3 terahash. It always fluctuates a little bit, but that's normal. One thing that this board cannot do is it cannot be a standalone board. What you need is some sort of an extra PC. And for this case, I do have a Raspberry Pi Zero here that is connected via USB to my Ref1 board. And by the way, the board that I showed you before is the first and ever built QX on this planet. So this is the revision one. This here is revision two. And the latest revision is the revision number three, but I have not built it. Revision number three is a little bit different from the components. It features a couple of other things, but the basic functionality is the same. So as I told you, this board cannot be a standalone one. You need to use a USB cable. In this case, it's USB-C, as you can see here. And then you need to connect it to an extra PC, which then runs a Python-based Bitcoin mining software which actually makes use of those ASICs and sends them commands. How does this function you might ask yourself? So you do see this port up here. This is the USB port. It goes through a couple of uh, little things here on this PCB into this STM. And this STM here is basically, you could call it a bridge between USB and those ASICs. Because what, what this STM does, it actually changes the input from USB and makes it readable, usable by those ASIC chips here. And then you can actually use those ASIC chips and send them serial commands and read what nonsense they are outputting. So this STM on here is necessary. There are some regards from some people that might be asking about, oh, why don't you use an ESP32? It is what it is. This one here, by the way, is 100% designed and assembled in Germany. So uh, probably some personal, I'd say, preferences from the product manufacturer or from the product designer. Uh, he's a friend of mine and he told me he's not interested in putting in anything else than an STM on it because he loves how STM works and functions. So that's it. There might be something in the future, we don't know. Um, 
I'm not capable of doing so at, at least at the moment. But yeah, that's that's what it is currently. And I want to go over a couple more parts that we do see here on this PCB. So I told about the I told you about the STM and how the functionality over USB is going. And I told you that we do have like four ASICs down here. What we also do have is when it comes to the voltage domain, this PCB here is only using one voltage domain. So there's no level shifting. Nothing when it comes to electronics and level shifting between different voltage domains, just one voltage domain and this whole PCB is one big piece of copper basically. It does have up to four layers. Uh, we do have the spec plane here and uh, yeah, it has up to four layers. It has plenty room for maybe adding one or two more ASICs on it, uh, but then you might come into a heating or cooling issue because as you see, like uh, this square that we do have here is perfect for an LGA1151 CPU cooler, but everything above this, like if you would increase the size or the number of ASICs, you would have some cooling issues probably. What you could do is extend the PCB and then put a second CPU cooler on it. That would probably function and that would also be a cool idea, I think. But then you would in increase a couple of other things as well, like the MOSFETs and the coils, probably to keep the voltage domain stable. While talking about this, up here we do see four MOSFETs and uh, what they are used for, they are basically using uh, the input voltage, which is 12 volts on this device here. And then just do some magic stuff and out there comes the perfect voltage that we do need for those ASICs. Uh, next to them we do have this huge components here, those are coils, uh, so just to keep them stable on their voltage, what they do need. And uh, one major thing that I want to make sure here is that you understand this one right here is a fuse. So whenever you do put in something above 12 volts, this fuse will blow up. So this is like a protection for the whole PCB. This is also a, a big difference to the bit X. If you do put in something else than 5 volts, the bit X, your bit X will be broken. You cannot use it any longer. It's probably broken on every single piece. Uh, so you probably will burn everything. And one cool thing that I uh, that, that, that we forget out as well is if you do have not proper cooling on those ASICs, instead of them blowing up because they want to draw more and more and more voltage, uh, this fuse blows up. So if you do not have proper cooling on this, uh, you, your fuse will break because this fuse is rated for 12 volt, 5 ampere and uh, nothing above this. If there's anything above it, it will blow. And uh, yeah, we tested this a couple days earlier and uh, yeah, there you go. So it's a perfect protection for your ASICs because you don't want to blow them up. Uh, probably there are a couple of improvements that you could definitely do as well. Uh, but that's it for now. On uh, the downside of, of the PCB, we do have a couple more capacitors, plenty more capacitors to be to be fair, uh, as you see, plenty more. And yeah, that's uh, that's basically the QX, that is basically what I want to tell you about it. I do still miss a couple of components on this PCB, but as I told you, I do have some troubles uh, programming it. And uh, while we're speaking about programming, let me show you a Pico probe. This here basically features a Raspberry Pi Zero or Raspberry Pi 2040, I believe it's how it is called. Uh, yeah, Raspberry Pi Pico, it actually is called. It does features uh, a probe connection, the, which would go over to this connection here, and then you could program the STM on here, because you actually need to program the STM, otherwise it just does not anything. And uh, this one here goes with a USB cable to your PC, and um, then you can actually flash the STM. It's currently not easily to do, and I want to show you a couple of things in one of the future videos. But today's video is only focused on how this design is, what it features, what it cannot do, and what differences it from the BitX. So uh, let's take a BitX for example, as you do see here. This one is a 2.2, this one is the one from RGZ Electronics that I tried to solder myself. I'm, I'm unable to get this up and running. Uh, I only have issues with it. Uh, that's another thing I need to investigate it later on, but nevertheless, um, it's it's a personal thing. I believe nothing about the components. They should function. I believe so as we see here We do have this ESP32 here, which is actually controlling everything and you actually could instead of Using USB connection anything else you could uh, Put an ESP on here and then this QX would function 
alone on itself, but that's not what it was meant to do. Um, if you imagine, you could plug in like multiple of those QXs right to each other and uh, just connect all of them via USB connable. Uh, like the revision for one here, as you do see, has a micro USB connection. This one has a USB connection. You could put in as many of those USB devices as you want into your Raspberry Pi. I mean, I could even plug in a USB hub and then have one Raspberry Pi Zero featuring up to, I don't know, like 20 different boards. How insane would this be? And keep in mind, guys, we are talking here about two terahash at 50 watts, so around 25 joules per terahash. That's not that bad. Um, there's probably some room for improvement, but uh, when we're talking about efficiency here on this board, something that you also cannot do with the QAX is changing the voltage domain for those ASICs. Actually, it's not really needed. Uh, those ASICs run currently at 1.205 volts. This is one of the most stable voltage domain levels that he figured out for the QAX and uh, I'm currently running them at 485 megahertz. That's the default megahertz level for an ASIC chip, or for this ASIC chip specifically. You could crank it up to 500 megahertz, then it would go above a little bit 2.1 terahash maybe. And uh, you wouldn't see much of an increase from the uh, wattage that you drain from the wall, something about like 55 watts maybe. This one is pretty good when it comes to the efficiency as well. And as you see, we do feature here four of those ASIC chips. This is also completely different to the BIDX itself, which only features one single ASIC chip. Um, the the BIDX hacks that will come out in the future will be able to feature up to six ASIC chips, so they'll be a little bit bigger than this one. But again, a BIDX hex is different from a QX. The QX itself on the design it features is been designed to use USB to connect as many as a one-to-one -one host machine. Each BIDX itself will create its own Wi-Fi so, or its own Wi-Fi connection and therefore be its own device. With the QX indifference, you could actually plug in as many as you want and on the pool they would show up as just one single one. So that's, that's pretty cool, I believe. That's pretty insane. And uh, yeah, those are the, the major things about the QX. And uh, yeah, the next video that I will do is I will show you how to actually flash the STM on here using the Piker probe and this connector. And then I also want to do a video about the QX software, the Python written software and what it can do and what it cannot do. And yeah, I, I believe that's a pretty insane one. That's pretty interesting. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Subscribe to this channel and like this video. In the future, I will also make a video about showing and explaining you how to set up your own public pool at home. This will be insane, believe me. So subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out and see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.